Welcome back everyone. I'm John Euler. This is Journey to Healing. We are in the midst of a series on grief and loss, but we're spending a, an in-depth uh, period of time looking at one of the key aspects or key issues that will prevent someone from successfully resolving loss in the past. One of the key things that has to take place is being able to resolve things in the here and now so that things can get calm enough so that you can resolve past hurts, past things that uh, need to be put to rest. So it's very important you look at what's going on in the here and now so that you can successfully resolve past uh, hurts, past grief and loss as well. What are some of those things that will hinder that? One is current day relationships that are unhealthy, that are toxic, that are selfish, that are violating as we've looked in the past. Um, uh, Matthew 7, verse 6, where Jesus said, Do not take what is holy, give to dogs, do not cast your pearls before swine. Uh, if you would like to go back and revisit some of those podcasts, you'll find an ever-growing repository on survivorsupport.net under podcasts. We're currently looking at, we're picking up where we left off before the break, uh, we're looking at what are those things that will hinder someone from implementing boundaries. And then we will eventually be looking at what are, bound, uh, what are the uh, goodness of fit kind of boundaries. How do you do that? What does a boundary look like? And we will be covering that in future podcasts. We're picking up where we left off. Uh, we just mentioned that one of the things that will keep us stuck from uh, keep us from implementing boundaries, or what uh, our fear, fear of what could have been, what might have been, what should have been, still hoping against hope that the relationship I have now that is harmful, that is hurtful, that is disappointing, could become something different. And so I keep staying in there, I keep hanging in there. And the question is, have I stayed too long? Have I allowed this thing to degenerate to a point where, I was going to say, where nobody's benefiting, and that's an interesting way of putting it, if in doubt, one thing you can tell yourself is, you know what, nobody's benefiting right now. And if you still think there's hope for the selfish person, the only thing that's going to help uh, clarify that are boundaries, are limits. Because if there is hope, that person has to start finally coming to terms with their issues to where they stop being selfish. So limits are the only things that are going to force them through the stages of maturity. Probably, though, the person is, has decided, the selfish person has decided they don't want to go through stages of maturity because they really benefit from you being like you are so they can be like they are. They are benefiting at your expense. As Jesus said, don't take what is important, don't take your pearls and give them to pigs. Why? Because the pigs will trample your pearls, they will devalue and disrespect them, they'll take them for granted, and then what will they do? They will then turn on you in some capacity. They will start chipping away at you, if you, or they'll do something more dramatic. And especially if you try to turn the pearls off. You turn the spigot off, and they'll turn on you for sure. So fear of ending the relationship too soon, or fear of putting boundaries, and therefore you feel like you would be the one to, uh, to be blamed for the ending of the relationship. I just worked with a client whose selfish husband who feigned to be a Christian, you know, you can actually have a fraud who goes to church. If you doubt that, then go back and revisit who Judas was. Jesus said, many people will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, you know, they're, they're speaking Christian ease, but he will say what? Depart from me, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. That means they're not, everybody that says they're going to heaven is not going to heaven. So you, you, there are a lot of frauds that are sitting in pews. And you can be married to one of those. He looks, the real, looks like the real deal. The scribes and Pharisees looked real. They looked really religious. And so people were intimidated by them. They kind of had the, the keys, as it were, to the religious system. But they were horrible. They were snakes. Remember? Jesus called them sons of their father, the devil, whitewashed tombs. So you can be a horrible individual going to church, fooling everybody except the people back home because they have to live 
with you if you're a, if you're a pig. But probably if you're a pig, you're not listening to this podcast. So if you're married to that kind of person, one of the things that can keep you stuck is f- fear of being blamed. So this one husband, the wife has begun putting up boundaries, very effective boundaries. He's more fi- actually he's unmasked. He's being unmasked. He's out coming the truth. <laughs> you know he's morphing. And so what does he do? He's actually now calling her mother. So he's calling his mother-in-law, telling her how much he loves the mother-in-law and how much he loves the daughter. And he's just so torn up. And maybe if the mother-in-law can talk to, you know, mom, can you talk to your daughter? I don't know what's going on. These guys know how to spin such a good yarn. So fortunately, the daughter invited the mother into session. So we have an adult daughter. We have the mother in and had a very, very good session helping the mother begin to realize that her, her son-in-law, who feigned at being a Christian, didn't have any proof, as evidenced by Galatians 5, Galatians 5. There was no, there was nothing there. Also, 1 Corinthians 13. And actually, what was going on behind the scenes, her daughter finally had a chance to share that. Well, the mother didn't know. So now the mother's not uh, schnookered. There's a word. She's not schnookered by this guy, and it's changed everything. So... So sad, too bad. The the pig doesn't, <laughs> he's not going to be able to work it as much. So she isn't going to feel like she ended things. Here's another aspect of fear that will prevent someone from implementing boundaries. Fear of being disobedient to God for not, ha- for not hanging in there long enough for being the one to end the marriage. Okay, uh, somewhat similar, but the other one has to do with people, people's opinion. But what about God? If you have been told certain things about how God feels, and does God hate divorce? Of course he does. But does that also mean that once you're in, you're in and no way out? Not necessarily. Divorce, there are reasons for that. Adultery, you are free to go. But is there, does it mean also that you have to stay there? There are no options. No. Read Proverbs chapter 26, 27, and 28. It'll make it clear. But here's another one out of the book of Proverbs. It says this. Throw out the mocker, and fighting goes out too. Quarrels and insults will disappear. But now I'm going to add some additional meaning of what the Hebrew says. Okay, So this is 3,000 years ago. And if you're a pastor, you need to start preaching this. And your church needs to support that lady. If she has a pig for a husband, you need to help her implement limits. You need to support her. Okay, so Proverbs 22.10 says, says this. Throw out the mocker. Throw out. That means drive out. This is not a polite little deal going on. We're, we're tossing him out. Now, how you do that it needs to be methodical, but at the same time, think about the emphasis. Throw out or drive out the mocker. Another word for mocker is scoffer. And it's really important to understand this. There are stages of selfishness, and there are stages, or in those stages, selfishness will manifest itself in different ways. By the time somebody becomes a mocker, they've already become a fool. Let me repeat that again. Think about a snowball and look at through, do a word study yourself. Look through Proverbs and Psalms and you will find that that a a mocker, somebody morphs into a mocker first and then he becomes, I'm sorry, morphs into a fool first, then he becomes a mocker or a scoffer. So if somebody is a mocker or a scoffer, they're already a fool. That's why they won't stop. This is now habitual. This is who they are. This is not a mild person. This is someone that goes for the emotional jugular. This is someone who is a a domestic, here it is, a family domestic terrorist. This is someone who loves seeing another person in pain. That is not a mild person. So if you have someone that mocks, who ridicules, who scoffs, does so in a brazen way, and they love seeing you squirm. This is not a habit. This is not a bad day. This is now a disposition. 
it is time. You throw him out, you drive him out, or it may be easier for you yourself to leave, but either way, there has to be distance. Okay, you throw him out, you drive him out, drive out the mocker or the scoffer, and guess what's gonna happen? Fighting, strife and contention goes out too. Isn't that great? Meaning, it finally gets calm. And kids do not benefit from the kind of strife that a mocker and a scoffer create. That is not healthy. You will create, you'll do permanent damage. You put them in that situation that that becomes their life. You will create, you'll guarantee they have anxiety, they'll have anxiety issues, they'll have uh, depressive issues, they will become compulsive, they may turn into drugs and alcohol. You will push them into antisocial stuff, why? because they have such anger on the inside because it will never stop. They're held hostage by your choices, by the way. They can't up and leave. They're depending upon you to make the right decision once you see it. And for me, the barometer is this. After about six months, if somebody has a disposition where they are creating a horrible situation in the home, it's time to think about separating. Certainly after a year, but that's where if you're part of a church and pastor, if you're listening to me or elders, you need, to, you need to have your finger on the pulse. You need to be approachable. And there are far too many churches that don't want to touch the issue of domestic violence. We're not even talking domestic violence. Once that's in the situation, then that's horrible. There should not be violence going on in a home. That's way beyond scoffer and mocker, isn't it? So you need to help that, that mother, you need to help that, that wife uh, with setting boundaries. You need to protect them. You need to start kick, kicking some pigs out of the church. <laughs> okay, why? So that quarrels and insults, strife and abuse will disappear, will cease. Church needs to become a haven of rest for the oppressed, uh, oppressed not for the oppressors. If someone's walking around with an attitude, it is not acceptable. It is time we, we put that issue to rest. Separation is a very legitimate option. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 11 to 15. It says, if the husband and wife separate, let them stay single, of course. Okay? You, you're not separating and start running, you know, running around. You're separating to try to get peace, to try to settle down and to give God enough room to start dealing with that, uh, the peg. Okay, so if you separate, you're not gonna go on a dating app, okay? Why, because you're too raw and it's not appropriate. You're still married. Uh, now, sometimes I understand this, meaning in a lot of different ways, uh, divorce, if it's going to be final and it's being drug out. So th there's a balance here. But it also doesn't mean that if, if the pig is dra dragging this out for two years, it also doesn't mean that you can't start uh, becoming friends with someone. Uh, I've lost probably half my audience, but uh, it doesn't matter. If, if the marriage is over, if it's clear it's over, and if they've had an affair, also if they've tried to do you significant harm, if they've tried to file false criminal charges again. If they've done some real uh, horrible things that it's clear, then it's over. So be mindful, but when you're separated, be mindful, okay? But you need to still separate so you can have peace, right? Quarrels and insults, strife and abuse will disappear and cease. If you are with an abusive person, you're actually disobedient. Right? You're disobeying Proverbs 22.10. Throw the guy out so abuse will stop. 2 Corinthians 11, uh, you know, 2 Corinthians 11 verses 19 and 20 says, in essence, do not tolerate someone that's abusing you. Do not do it. You're not being spiritual. Okay. What are some of the other things that will keep you stuck? Some mistaken notions. Okay. But I actually, I want to go back to uh, one more fear. Sorry. Fear of change. So that's going to be another thing. Why aren't you implementing boundaries? It may be that you just are fearful. Maybe you've become so familiar with pain, so used to it. It's interesting. Sometimes the issue of family, it's familiar. 
that's a familiar kind of pain. At least you know how to work with the chaos, but the Lord has not called us to chaos. He's called us to peace. So fear of change can cause me to remain stuck. Fear of moving outside of your comfort zone. But that's where Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 comes in. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, meaning trust him, and he'll direct your path. So it is not spiritual to remain in an abusive relationship. And that's probably that's one of the mistaken notions. So some mistaken notions that will keep you stuck about what it means to be loving or nice and spiritual. Again, it is not it's not nice to be nice. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's not good to be nice because it's not healthy to be nice. Okay, because that simply means you're trying to pacify selfish people. It's good to be kind. Nice people do not have boundaries. Kind people have boundaries because they know how much kindness to give and also when it's no, no longer being kind, when it's actually being enabling. Enabling simply, simply means this. You're allowing a pig to be a pig and you're giving him more room to be hurtful. And it is not spiritual to continue to assume that a pig is the same thing as a prodigal. Very, di- very different. The prodigal son never hurt anyone else. Mistaken notions about uh, that, you, that you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. That's a mistaken notion. Jesus had very little tolerance for his family in a way. Remember, they were going to come and have him locked up in a psych ward. I think it's early in the book of Mark. There's a couple of the Gospels that talk about this. Jesus is talking, uh, and the, the, brothers and the brothers are embarrassed, so are his sisters, but Mary went along. They were going to take him by force, his brothers were, and they were going to have him committed. So they arrive, so did the scribes and Pharisees, and that's when Jesus said, a house that is divided is splintering apart. It won't be able to stand. He was sending a message to to them. Well, they couldn't get to him because he's talking in a house. And so they send word. Hey, your mother and brothers and sisters are here. And he he snubbed them. He looked at them, then looked at the crowd around him, and he said, "Who, Who are my mothers and brothers and sisters? Those that do the will of God, those that hear my words. So he put up boundaries with them. Sometimes the greatest hindrance that you have can be your own family. So you can choose your family, meaning you can choose how much to be around them. If they were not your family, would you spend time around them? Then why are you spending time around them? It's possible to have an entire family of pigs. Jesus said he did not necessarily come to bring peace, but a sword. Setting family relationships against one another. Why? And that's not just in salvation. If family members are causing you to compromise truth, if family members are causing you to not leave and cleave, they are in direct opposition to the will of God and you need to draw boundaries. If family members are are meddling, if family members are trying to usurp your parenting, if family members are trying to usurp the place of your spouse, to test your loyalty, then it's time to separate, okay? By degrees, it's time to start putting boundaries. What's the very first thing uh, that is required for a boundary and therefore what's the first thing you do? You begin by speaking the truth in love. Not nice, but effectively, speaking the truth in a reasonable way. It's time to become honest with them. What are some other mistaken notions? Blood is thicker than water. Really? Uh, that's meaning we're dealing with family now. Blood is thicker than water. And I say, who's blood? Isn't that interesting? That phrase is inevitably said by the selfish people, meaning you just have to sit there and take it. That is not scriptural. That is not spiritual. That's in violation of what Jesus said. Do not cast your pearls before swine. So it is, it is a misnomer. That is not scriptural. The blood is thick in the water. No, as a matter of fact, it may be that you have created an idol of your family relationships. Genesis 12, the Lord told Abraham to go away from his family 
As a matter of fact, let me see. I'm going to look it up. Okay, he told them. I just want to make sure <laughs> I've got the chapter right. I know I have the chapter right. Um, but he told them. As a matter of fact, I will find it for you. There it is. The Lord said to Abraham. Okay, there we go. So I've got, I recommend one of these folks. I, I use the uh, New Living Translation, which is different than the Newer World Translation. That's a cult version, okay? But the New Living Translation is very, very good. Um, Genesis 12. The Lord said to Abram, leave your native country, but he adds to it, leave your relatives and leave your father's family and go to a land that I will show you. We got concentric circles going on. Leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family. I mean, that's all family. And in one translation, it says, for your own benefit. There are times that it's time to leave. Okay. Now, again, you don't want to do an emotionally reactive thing, up and leave, without them knowing why. Though if it's bad, then you need to up and leave. And if it's that bad, then they will know. But I always recommend, ideally, that you have that conversation with them first to dispel all doubt. And it's probably going to be you're just announcing to them. Okay. Mistaken notion that all parents care about their children. We wish that were true. If that were true, we wouldn't have any deadbeat dads. How many deadbeat dads did I deal with while I was on psychology staff in the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections for 11 years? You wouldn't have a bunch of dads. This is a you know crass term, but this is how they how they, how they say it in prison. Uh, spreading their seed all over the place. Meaning, if you have a bunch of kids to a bunch of women, you do not care about your kids. And how many times would I have some of these guys debate with me? Oh no, no, they care. And then I said, really? Okay, how involved are you in the life of your kids? Oh, I'm very involved. Are you? So you have nine kids. How many days of the week are there? Oh, I'm, I, I'm so... <laughs> and the, guy, the guy's in, in for drugs. He's in for running the streets. He hasn't seen his kids forever. So he's lying straight to my, straight to my face. Okay. You are as caring of a parent as you are involved in the life of your kid. If you think otherwise, you're delusional and you're lying to yourself. You, you only care as much as you put your money where your mouth is. Now, some of you have gone through things where you can't be involved in the life of your kids. That's very, very different because my guess is you want to then. Okay. But thinking that your parents, if they are abusive, if they're emotionally abusive to you, they're probably older depending upon the age you are listening to the sound of my voice. Okay. But it is a misnomer to believe that every single parent cares about their child. There's another blunt phrase, but it's important. Just because somebody gets pregnant or, or gets somebody else pregnant does not mean they're going to care about the offspring. Okay, there's other ways of saying that, but right? Just because you got somebody, uh, just because a guy gets a woman pregnant does not mean he's going to care about the kid. And the same thing for a woman. Think about Mother Gothel, though she wasn't the biological mother, but think about Mommy Dearest. There's an adoptive situation. You would think if any kind of parent is going to care about a kid, it's going to be one who adopted a child. So now we have by choice. So certainly that must be the most loving of all situations. And then foster care, of course, that because foster parents know they're dealing with wounded people, right? So it's not the case. It is just not the case. So do not allow that mistaken notion to hinder you being honest and you being put uh, you putting up limits. Okay. Mistaken notion. Another one is that being emotionally irresponsible and hurtful is for their best because it will toughen them up. Meaning this. That you've been willing to allow them to be emotionally responsible and hurtful to you because it's going to toughen you up. Or if you're that parent, meaning that this is a big statement, that you give yourself permission to toughen them up. Where did you hear that? As a matter of fact, I can guarantee you, you don't have to live under that, right? We say, well, you know, school's important because how are they going to learn to be tough? Meaning what? Well, they got to handle themselves on the, on the playground and, you know, a little bit of fight and, okay, let me ask you, when's the last time you had to deal with that at work? Do you, do you have to be tough at the gas pump? Do you have to be tough at the water cooler? 
No, we sort of, now I, uh, trust me, I understand all the different arguments, but the reality is this. If you are subjecting a child to hurt, meaning you're hurting a child to toughen them up, you're warped. The way you toughen them up is you build resilience to life in and of itself. There's enough going on in life that a kid has to deal with. You don't have to artificially create it. You're not a drill sergeant. If you're a drill sergeant, you got issues. Okay? Meaning, if you're a drill sergeant at home, you got real issues. I know of a number of situations where guys that couldn't leave it at the office, if they were a cop, you know, a police officer, if, if they're a drill sergeant, when they came home, how'd they treat their kids? It's irresponsible. Okay, and um, mista another mistaken notion is that they really don't mean what they say. And what, I, what they say is they're giving themselves permission to run their mouths. Meaning, oh, I, I know what he says, but he really doesn't mean it. That means you're treating him as not very capable. Trust me, he's capable. How do I know? Well, we will pick that up at that point next time on the next edition of Journey to Healing. You've been listening to Journey to Healing, sponsored by SurvivorSupport.net. We trust you've been helped by the information our host, John Euler, has shared. To donate to this ministry, schedule a personal consultation with John, or to arrange a professional training for your church or organization with John, simply visit our website. On behalf of Survivor Support, we look forward to hearing from you and to have you join us next time on Journey to Healing.